welcome back everybody. Dan John here from danjohnuniversity.com. This is episode 123, episode 123 of the podcast. Uh, welcome aboard. Um, today's questions, uh, there's a lot of big questions today. Um, I might have to actually break up my uh, time answering them into two segments because there's just so much to cover today. I'll do my best. Uh, small reminder, uh, we have a New Year's special going on. It's going to be $29 for three months, which is really good, considering it's $29 a month. Um, the code is New Year, one word, New Year, one word. I think it's supposed to be done in all capitals, but I it probably would work either way. Um, sign up, welcome aboard, make a difference. Uh, I think... For fat loss, uh, December, January, February are probably the best times of the year for fat loss uh, because, well, if you live where I live, it's so cold that your body has to make all those big time adaptions to uh, dealing with the cold. And uh, if you wear short sleeves and you go out and shovel, uh, you come in and you have that, you can just feel your body heating up for hours at a time. And there was some research a while ago that said that was probably pretty good. Art Devaney supports it. Uh, of course, uh, there's a lot of others who support it. Wim Hof, of course, has a whole series of books and workshops on it. Uh, when I'm shoveling snow, I don't do his breathing technique. I simply, <laughs> I simply throw snow. But uh, there is some real value in uh, attacking fat loss this time of year. I th and I also think the foods this time of year uh, are helpful. The soups and the stews, which... Um, you know, last night we had this delicious uh, garbanzo bean uh, concoction that was a stewish, a vegetarian garbanzo bean stew. It was extremely filling. It was extremely spicy. And gosh, I got to tell you, I feel great. You know, uh, that's that's why I like this time of year. Um, uh, I like all times of year. But uh, I hope that helps. And remember, new year. One word for the discount. Let's get started. We have a question, and I can't, well, it's from someone named Dan. What a delightful name. As someone who started his weight loss journey at 275 pounds, uh, 125K for my European listeners of worldwide listeners, now 265, 120, 48 years old. Boy, I'm glad you lost that uh, at 48. Uh, I lost a bunch of that weight at first strictly through running. Now that I'm taking more of a Maffy tone approach to endurance and strength work, I have discovered that even a weighted ruck does not get my heart rate past 110 uh, beats per minute. Uh, <clears throat> there is a problem, Dan, right before I even answer the question. Rucking by itself doesn't necessarily get the heart rate up where it needs to be. Um, that's why uh, I like putting the ankle weights on. I like putting the, the weights in my hands. Because as you get the weight out farther from the body, it becomes more and more inefficient. It might simply be for you, and especially at your size, at 265. Well, there's, hang on, there's a, I mean, uh, you know, a weighted ruck might not be working perfectly for you. I, so, Dan, here's the issue. There, there's, there's two issues. One, for some people, you, you might just be too strong for the, for the load you have. So... Uh, put them out into your hands, put them on ankle weights, see if that helps. Um, having said that, as you're losing the weight, doing the rucking, you, you know, you're going to become more and more efficient uh, because of the weight loss. So maybe you need to change your, your, your loads on your rucks. You don't give me ruck numbers here, but let's go to the question. My question to you, given the focus on more Maffy Tone type training, would lower heart rate running, yes, I wear a chest strap, be an acceptable substitute for weighted rucks so long as the emphasis continues to be on keeping the heart rate at its recommended 180 minus age, plus or minus any supporting or limiting factors? Well, the fact that you're 48, uh, and if you don't really have any long-term, you know, uh, lower back, knee, hip, ankle, feet issues, though for some people, Running leads right into lower back issues. Um, if you can do that, now obviously, I don't, I don't want to see a lot of jogging, that, that straight up and down stuff. I would like it to be a little bit smoother. Um, <clears throat> if you can find 
boy, ideally a, a beautiful path through, you know, piney woods with the, the pine needles as a carpet. And, I mean, that'd be ideal. Or a beach, you know, something like that. I, I think it's a great idea. Um, as long as you're, if, if losing weight is your your goal here, and I'm just guessing it by the by some of the stuff, it, it seems like you you understand the impact that it's going to be on your health and longevity just by the way you're an, asking the questions. And on the body weight dropping, this might be a good idea. Say like, so say like you get in two or three years of of running, and again, I hope it's, and it can be low intensity. It can be, uh, though I would mix it up like the Swedes used to call it was called fartlek where, you know, maybe sprint hills, uh, walk downhill. Uh, if you have a soft surface, you glide across it. And you kind of change with every, uh, um, whatever whatever you, you come up with, you kind of change your, 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 your stride, your, your, the way you attack it. You know, if you get two or three years, and let's just say, let's say you want to weigh 220. I'm just throwing that out. There's no magic 100, uh, 100 kilos. So go to 120 to 100. I'm just pulling that out of the air. And if you did that over a three-year period and got yourself down to 220 and held that, you know, your joints, uh, the, that that weight that you take off would be such a boon to your joints that I, I think you'd have a nice, you know, you'd have a nice little seesaw, you know. Yeah, running can be difficult on some people's feet, ankles, knees, hips, lower back. But uh, being heavier has, has the same hits. So maybe that running for a few years will balance out with the, with the weight loss. Yeah, I think it's just fine. Um, it'll be interesting, uh, the experiments. It's going to take you a while to get yourself to that heart rate that you want to be at. It's just, it, it takes a few times. And then make sure you keep using the heart rate monitor because what you're going to find, like for me, I like the talk test the most. As long as I can talk and interact, generally my heart rate is where it should be. Um, but what I've discovered is when I, in, uh, last summer when we took the, my walking, I basically doubled it. Uh, my talk test number, my I was able to talk a lot with a lot higher heart rate. So I had to, I had to kind of bring it down again. Uh, it is a wonderful thing. Uh, heart rate monitors uh, and training just give you such fascinating insights, you know. Uh, what you think was hard or e easy, your body is responding. No, no, it's not. So, hey, great question, and thank you so much. Get back to me. So I got a question from Mark. Mark says, when the pandemic started, I switched from barbell training to mostly calisthenics, chin-ups, dips, and pistol squats. Then once or twice a week, uh, I walked to the park with a 10-kilogram medicine ball in one hand, so I start with a long distance lightweight suitcase carry. We could. Then I slam and throw the medicine ball around before walking back home. I really like this. I feel like I'm always slamming the ball harder and throwing it further. But now that I can go back into the gym, I was curious. For a guy approaching his mid 30s that doesn't specialize in any sport, what do I lose if I stick to these high rep medicine ball throws over heavy deadlifts and cleans? Well, the first thing is. You're gonna, it'll, like you already noticed, it's fun. I mean, it's I, I love throwing stuff because, you know, uh, if you have a partner, I mean, we have we have a couple of games we play. Uh, I don't play this much anymore because I, I don't really have the equipment. And uh, but we call it's called Hoover Ball. It's where you play uh, volleyball, and you can look the game up. There's actual rules. Uh, you play volleyball with a medicine ball. Uh, I suggest more of a four or six pound Dynamax ball because it's just easier on the fingers. But my favorite game uh, with a medicine ball is called Ultimate, and I, and I do this with my St. Mary students uh, in uh, Twickenham, uh, <laughs> is you play Ultimate Frisbee, but you play it with a medicine ball. And uh, all of a sudden, you, you, you know, you, you're out there for half an hour, 45 minutes, and <sighs> everyone's weirdly tired, but also having so much fun, you just keep playing through. It is interesting to watch people eat after that because they... They tend to be like, "Wow, I'm I'm strangely hungry." Well, yeah, you just threw this ball around and sprinted up and down a field for an hour without even ever, you know, doing this or that, which is all fine, of course. Yeah, I, I think you, you know, uh, a real easy way to think about this, Mark, is when you can go out and play, go out and play. 
So in the spring, summer months, if, if you live where I live, that's it's medicine ball time. In the winter months where I live, uh, that would be your clean and deadlift time. And I think uh, long term, I think you'll really enjoy this to finish up on your questions. Is it unwise to return to the gym to build mass with compound exercises, uh, but relegate my Olympic lifts in favor of medicine ball throws? Will people still ask me to help them move their pianos? Trust me, uh, if you do it, we just discussed, you know, clean and deadlift and Olympic lift when appropriate, medicine ball when appropriate, and even mix them in a week. There's nothing wrong with that. I think long term, you'll be moving people's pianos for a long, long time. And that, of course, is the most important thing of all, is uh, being the person that people call up when they want to move a couch. And uh, I'm proudly that person. So uh, love your question. Uh, the nice thing is you gave me two extraordinarily great options to pick from. And my answer was do them both. I hope that helps. Thanks. We have a question from Sandy. Sandy says, I'm currently planning my training to cross Bass Strait in a sea kayak. This is the uh, stretch of ocean between mainland Australia and Tasmania. Boy, I don't know if I can help on this, but I'll help as I can, as a strength coach. Big tidal currents, strong winds, big swells, long crossings between islands, up to 75 kilometers, which uh, is a long way. It's about 50 miles-ish. Uh, I have the sport-specific training sorted, as I've done similar trips in the past, but I want to continue keeping my strength training ticking over while I'm doing mostly sports-specific training for the upcoming sea kayaking trip, early February 2022. Am I, I am too old to let my strength and muscle mass slide. Thank you, Sandy. Easy strength seems perfect for this and won't leave me too fatigued for my main kayak training. But what four exercises why? What four exercises would you recommend? Well, I mean, I, I'm just going to give you the basics. Uh, a vertical press, a vertical pull, probably you're in a kayak, but yeah, still. Um, a rack deadlift, a trap bar deadlift, something like that. And the ab wheel. There you go. Don't make it more complicated. Stay away, stay away from anything that feels sport-specific at all. Um if you decide to do kettlebells, you can do single hand or double press or seesaw press, uh, pull-ups, chin-ups, parallel grip pull-ups, uh, lat pull-downs are just fine for you. Uh, Band-supported pull-ups are, are fine. Uh, keep that hinge movement high. Um, don't, don't pick it up off the floor. I mean, you know, raise the bar up. You can use blocks or you can use a rack. Uh, or trap bar, that one that one kind that you can flip over and have, they have the higher handles. And something like an ab wheel or any kind of, any kind of big uh, ab movement here. Uh, don't, don't go crazy on, on any of the reps. Two sets of five will be fine with all that. And slowly tick those numbers up. But you're going to get, <laughs> you're going to get a lot, so much work doing this. I, I wouldn't worry too much about uh, losing any hypertrophy. Uh, I, I, I have other concerns about your, your crossing, but uh, strength isn't one of them. Well, I mean, strength will help. Uh, strength will, 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 will see you through a lot of issues. So I, I hope that helps. Thank you. We have a question from Anna. We have an 11-year-old son who loves to play hockey, soccer, and race his skis. Do you have any recommendation for good books for authors like uh, for a kiddo like this? It can be fiction or nonfiction, biographies or autobiographies. The books don't have to be specific to these particular sports at all. Just fitness and sports and training in general for this age group. Well, first off, I mean, I sure hope he reads The Sword and Stone. Hope he reads Dune, uh, The Count of Monte Cristo. These are all books that uh, discuss, uh, heck, even The Hobbit, really. Uh, these are all books that, that talk about the journey, uh, the, the importance of learning in life. So I would start with those um, as I look around, hoping. Uh, I got a lot of inspiration out of a, a book called Seven Days to Sunday by Elliot Asanoff because he had little uh, player profiles on uh, in every chapter, every day of the week. Um, when I was young, I want to say the guy's name was Tex Maul, M-A-U-L-E. And there was this whole section in the, in the library about these kind of inspirational books where Nothing bad ever really happened, but everyone had to over overcome things. 
I, I didn't know if they still rank books like that. I, I'm, I'm sure they do. Um, and the best resource we have in the United States, and I don't, you might not have it, is Scholastic Book Services, SBS. They always have really good, appropriate, inspirational, uplifting stories for youth. Uh, and of course, here in the United States, they're the ones that made Harry Potter the household name. So, I mean, oh, I hope he's read Harry Potter. Um, yeah, I mean, Harry Potter, uh, Young King Arthur, um, uh, young, you know, the, the Count of Monte Cristo, uh, Bilbo, those, those are all stories that these are people who overcome, uh, you know, uh, difficulties and, uh, and in learning, uh, they, they get themselves in a place that helps. Uh, I sure hope he falls in love with reading as much as he, he loves sports. Because, man, I... My my career, the reading I did, you know, and right there, right there, Sword and Stone, right there. And of course, all those other books, you know. Um, I, I've always felt that athletics and academics just walk together. Gosh, I hope that helps. Okay, we got a question from Brigu. In my gym, we have a farmer walk and sled push test. The test is as follows. 100 meter farmer walk with two kettlebells at 20 kilos each. 100 meter sled push. 80 kilos, 176 pounds. 100 meter farmer walk now heavier with uh, 24 kilos and 100 meter sled push with 176. So farmer walk, sled push, farmer walk, sled push. Yeah, The goal is to try to finish this circuit as fast as possible. That's uh, 400 meters of uh, pushing and pulling. That's pretty good. The current gym record is 430. My timing time is 530. Any tips on how to, I can get better at this test? Oh, yeah. Uh, face it like a track athlete. Um, one thing you might want to do sometime is uh, show up with maybe half loads. So uh, instead of 10 kilos in hands and 24, go 10 and 12. Instead of 80, go 40. And do it as fast as you can with those lighter loads and see if that's what, what impact that has on your test. Um, because if you get like 330, which can that be roaring, basically that tells me you're not strong enough. Um, maybe do an occasional, so I would do that test first. And then after that, do a, a super loaded one, as much loads as you could, you know, I don't know, whatever you got, kilos wise, but you could even just do the double 24s is simply, or if you have heavier kilos, uh, heavier bells, go from there. And with the sled push, you know, um, you know, you're not going to get much, 90 or hundred kilos is really at the, at the top. I mean, you really just, it just becomes a, <laughs> the equipment, it just digs in so much. You really don't get much out of it. But so a half one racing and then kind of double loaded one or looking at double, but you know, a heavier load and look at those two times. Uh, I would have a couple of days in between those. So you're, you're fairly fresh. Look at the two times and see what the impact of the load is having on your test. Um, if I were you, I would build up to um, maybe three rounds of the test uh, about once every two weeks. That'll be tough. So, but but here's here's the caveat. Uh, so you do the farmer walk with 12 kilos and you do the sled push with 40 or 60 kilos. You do it full rest period, I mean 10, 15 minutes, whatever it takes, you do it, full rest period, and then you do it, and you practice uh, the test. Uh, like I'd have a 400 meter runner, um, very often we'd have them run three really hard 400 meters. That's why I always like dual meets for my uh, athletes. Uh, dual meets for preparing track and field athletes, uh, it's it's the best. If you If you can get your 400 meter person to run the open 400 meters the four by four and then another event either the 200 or whatever you can figure out uh, figure out by by the schedule whatever it is uh when they have the baton in their hand they run and they're racing they run much faster and differently than when we're training so if you're a track coach and you can get two dual meets uh early in the season a week that is your training you don't I mean, really, 
track practice becomes uh, warm up, you know, form work, a few other things. But the, the real actual training happens uh, at the meet. So yeah, I would say that that those would be my ideas. Test it light, test it heavy, and then build up to the test. I would spend the bulk of your time uh, preparing for this with lighter loads, going faster, trying to get yourself at that 430 mark. Try to find a load that gets you at 430. And the load, honestly, could be, you know, a 100-meter walk back and forth, uh, 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 an empty sled, uh, a walk back and forth, and an empty sled. You know, if that, you know, if that takes you, I don't know, two minutes, then, you know, then that'll give you an idea what the load is really doing for you. And it is adding that two and a half uh, uh, minutes. So practice the event itself, I would say at least twice a week with lighter loads and build up to the triple day every other week for a while. Okay, that's just a spitball, but I think it'll work. Thank you. We have a question from Mike. Now, I don't necessarily agree with this, but let's go through the question. Mike asked this, thinking of trying the Big 21 program, uh, Dan John University, you can just plug in the numbers. It's very simple. However, it's for the clean and press, the snatch, and the clean and jerk. What this Mike is asking, for the overhead press, front squats, and deadlifts, and taking your hint to lower the reps from fives to threes on deadlifts. Okay. I know this isn't the original Big 21 uh, program exercises, but as a strongman competitor, these exercises are a bit more in line with my current sport and weaknesses. I'm 51 years old, 198, 90 kilos, and currently have a 440 deadlift, 330 front squat, and 220 overhead press. That's interesting because your your overhead press is so strong compared to your, uh, your deadlift there. Hoping to get 500 DL, uh, 405 front squat, and 250 overhead press before 2023. Do you have any set rep ideas to get me to my goals quicker? Yeah, I... I I mean, I can see why you'd want to do the Big 21 just to do it, and I applaud that. It's going to be a tough three weeks, and it's going to suck. I would not suggest you think uh, I would make your finishing number in the overhead press maybe 195. So uh, workout number nine, uh, last lift, say 200 pounds. And even then, that's going to be rough. Um, do that with the other numbers too so that, Maybe your last deadlift on the last day is just a 405. For those of you who haven't done the program, I mean, he's going to be doing 21 serious reps, and the last six are all singles, uh, heavier, 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 heavier. And uh, there might be value, but this is going to be a one-off idea. You're going to do it one time a year. Uh, we've done it up to twice. And i got to tell you, it, for discus throwers, that second one, when the numbers were perfectly dialed in, that seemed to be better than 90% uh, uh, of the crap we were doing. Um, so yeah, I can see you doing it, but honestly, um, I'd much rather see you do some basic kind of program. Um, I love Wendler's bigger but boring, uh, especially in the off season for strongmen. That's when you do you do the four movements, five, three, one, and then the movement you aren't doing that day, you do five sets of ten. So. If you're lifting four days a week, example here, folks, and you're doing the 531 deadlift, you might do five sets of 10 in the military press after. Uh, any basic powerlifting program will get you those numbers. Um, that The only thing I look at on those numbers is that your 405 front squat is so much bigger than your deadlift. And I, I'd love to see... Uh, I'd love to see your deadlift technique because it just seems that with that great overhead press number you have and that front squat, squat goal you have, your deadlift's awfully low. As a strong man, you need a big hinge, you need a big overhead press, and you need a big squat. It is a very strange, it's a very strange sport. And you need big farmer walks. I don't see any farmer walking here. You need, you know, big loaded carry work. Um, there is a beauty in strongman competition, you know, and there's issues with the, you know, maybe the sport, um, uh, just cause there's gonna be questions below the issues with the sport is a lot of young men die. 
and that, that I worry about that. Um, I, I do. Um, but I, I like where your head's at. Um, do it. Maybe here's just a spitball thought. Do do it one time. Take take some time off and do it again with the numbers more perfectly dialed in, and and get back to me and see what you think. Hope that helped. Okay, now we have a question from Enrique. Now I think Enrique must have asked a lot of questions, or we got a really big following from Enrique. So to all you Enriques out there, welcome aboard. I would like to know your thoughts and what fitness tests you recommend doing to keep track as you age. I'm 42 and remember doing the president's physical fitness tests. Yeah, I remember those too. I am starting a two times a year fitness test for my friends and I. We all train different, but like to see overall how we do against each other and keep an accountable and keep us accountable to ourselves as we train. Well, it's one of those rare times. I actually have a whole book. It's called Can You Go? Uh, the first thing is, can you stand on one foot for 10 seconds? You know, I'm telling you, if you're going to do this with a group, uh, tell everybody what the tests are and maybe have everyone stand on one foot. And, and by the way, left or right, it's, it's no big deal. But do it two different ways. I, I guess you could go left foot and right foot two different ways. But no, that's four tests. But uh, the second time, uh, so stand on one foot, left foot, right foot, and then close your eyes left foot, right foot, and time them. The difference is can be stunning. Uh, the next measurement is pretty simple. Uh, I, I like body weight. I really do like body weight. Uh, and I know body weight doesn't mean anything, you know, but you'll notice all throughout my gyms and my house, I, I have all kinds of these. These are called measuring tapes, okay? And this is actually my, my favorite one. And I always travel with one of these. And the next test is you measure you make you measure your waist and of course when you sit it seated down it's a lot more yeah it's a lot more than when you stand up uh actually there is uh the eads e-a-d-e-s dan and mary eads they do a very interesting test i think where they uh so you measure your waistline and then you lay on the ground and then you measure how tall your stomach is so you lay on the ground like this and you measure the height of your stomach and of course, there's a kind of fat that is on top of your stomach, which is a, a unhealthy in others. So my tests are pretty simple. Um, stand on one foot. I like those options I gave you. Um, weight has a really, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's a, it's a number. And sometimes a number really does help drive uh, goal setting. Uh, measure your waistline, standing up, uh, try to have your Try to have your belt line parallel to the ground, so squeeze your butt cheeks a little bit. And if the person can't get their belt line parallel to the ground, well, there you go. Try this little idea of measuring, uh, laying down on the ground and measuring. Uh, the other three parts of Can You Go might not work well here, but then uh, the four tests I like are the standing long jump. So I think the standing long jump is, I think it's amazing. I think you should be able to jump as far as you are tall um, that's just like a basic, a standard. Uh, I've had athletes go 50% above that. And when they do, so if you're, I'm going to use, uh, feet and inches, but if you sick, if you're six foot, you jump nine, that seems to be an important line in the sand for, uh, good athletes. <laughs> Obviously, if you go farther, it's even better. Um, I do the farmer walk. We use the trap bar and we use natural numbers, um, if, if it's kilos, we'd have you do 60, probably 80, 90, and 100. If you weigh more than 100, we'd have you do 100. And you, so uh, with uh, uh, pounds, you would use uh, 135, 185, 205, 225. Those are the natural numbers, you know, 45, 25, 35, 45s, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, you, you, I expect you to make a loop of 100 meters. So it's 50 down and 50 back. By the way, it has to be a loop. It'll save you so much work. Having someone go straight out and fail is just a ton of work to bring the weight back. Uh, and then we record that. So staying long jump, we record that farmer bar with those natural weights. And don't get too cute. If you weigh 206, you use 225. If you weigh 205, you use 205. 204, you weigh 205. You know, just make them real simple. Uh, I do like to have a Turkish get-up test of some kind. Uh, you can just go online, look at my get back up test, and just just 
that they can do it. Uh, I like the half a glass of water, a plastic cup, half a glass of water being able to do a Turkish get up, you know, as you, you know, as you go down and, you know, the arm keeps moving to positions. Uh, I like that both hands. Um, this nothing is very, uh, nothing very fancy there. Um, be nice to have like, uh, we do that, you know, that six minute goblet squat test. So every 30 seconds, so basically you set the timer, do it three minutes first time. Every 30 seconds you set the timer. And uh, so, uh, okay, so at zero, 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 I'm standing, I squat, and then I drop back down. And I sit on the bottom for 30 seconds. 24 kilo bell, whatever is appropriate. 16, whatever. Every time that 30 second goes up and then back down. Minute comes around, up, back down. Minute and a half, up, back down. Two minutes, up, back down. 2.30, and then three minutes, they stand up and put the weight down. The goal is for six minutes, and I tell you, that is an outstanding test. Another test you might want to play with is how many pull-ups you can do from the hang. So you hang for 30 seconds, do one pull-up, hang for 30 seconds. Two, uh, my standard for my military guys is four my standards for most people is a two. It's so much harder than you think. So much harder than you think. Yeah, um, those are some simple ones. Uh, certainly, if you go see my hard style kettlebell book, I've got a whole bunch of things you can do with push-ups and stuff like that. But you know, don't 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 do too many things. Uh, you'll find though that those little measurements, uh, the waist measurement, the laying down waist measurement. Um, gosh, I guess you could just use like a school ruler for that maybe a even a t a t ruler for that <laughs> don't make it too fancy I, i'm already my brain has gone way too far so uh, i like the idea i do i do uh we used to do that uh can you go test once a year and i don't know why we don't i don't know why we don't it's a it's a great thing and it really exposes you to a lot of other issues get the book can you go and then uh go from there <laughs> thank you Okay, we got a question from Justin, and boy, this question got here uh, just in time. <laughs> I ran across an old thread of yours on DaveDraper.com. I wish I had bookmarked it so I could send it along, but I forgot because I was excited about what I read and had to go reflect on it. The gist of your reply was, eight months of becoming bulletproof, uh, Tim Anderson's program, easy strength and easy endurance, Maffetone's heart rate program. That 180 minus uh, your age number is the top. And then 160 minus your age uh, is the bottom number. You want to stay between those. The other four months do some kind of challenge or peak or something. Yeah, and I think I discussed that in depth in my uh, programming uh, uh, course that's available at Dan John University. Finally, the questions. For Becoming Bulletproof, were you referring then or now to Becoming Bulletproof, a project by Tim Anderson? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I don't wouldn't do everything he says. He's got some... I got to tell you, what I think his best drill on that in that whole book, um, you have a whole bunch of things here, but he puts up uh, two foam rollers. So you put up foam rollers, and, and, and okay, you, you vertical up, again, foam rollers, and you don't put them very far apart, like, Let's, I don't remember exactly, but let's say it's six feet. And what you do is you do backward bear crawl figure eights around them and you go for as long as you can. You know, it doesn't look like much, but since you have to aim so you don't knock over the foam rollers, so you're, as you're going, okay, you have to keep your head back here with this big twist. And, of course, you have to guide your rear end around these things. It's a great idea. Uh, battle ropes. Climbing a mountain. One upper body, one lower uh, movement is pyramid. So you would do uh, one push-up, one squat, two push-ups, two squats, three, three, four, four, up to ten. And then ten, nine, nine, eight, eight, seven, seven. Moving water between buckets. That's a good one. But I'm curious how you structure the work. Here's how I see it. And feel free to say, just stop, do the work. Yeah, just stop, do the work. Um, but okay. Um, a bit of a warm-up, easy strength, becoming bulletproof work, easy endurance, bit of a cool down. Justin, that is, that's better than, well, you know, the other day, I, uh, people love the fact that I said 95% of the crap I see online. 
Dude, that's better than 99.8%, percent uh, of the stuff you see online. So you would do a, some kind of warm-up. You would do your vertical press, your vertical pull, your rack deadlift, your kettlebell swings, five sets of 15, your ab wheel. You would do, uh, you would do whatever the, you know, your, your rope battle, your, your whatever fun become bulletproof thing. And then you go uh, pop off while you're still heart rating and, uh, you know, get your walk, run, bike, swim, whatever in. And then cool down, and yeah, I mean, that's just, that's really good. And then come home and do what I do. Uh, I always start off uh, after my workouts. I, I have this vegetable soup, and uh, it's 120 cal uh, calories, and it's a fair amount. And I eat that first. It's just vegetables. There's no barley. There's no pasta. It's just vegetables. 120 calories. And the question I always ask people is, where are the calories coming from? And then after that, I eat some kimchi with oatmeal, and my oatmeal has... Lots and lots of three different seeds, uh, chia, hemp, and uh, flax seeds, and with protein. And after I eat the vegetables, after I eat the oatmeal, after I eat the kimchi, uh, I come back in and I work for a long, long time and wonder why I have been doing this my whole life. So if you get some good sleep in, some good recovery, and take care of business, Justin, uh, you're going to be very, very pleased with what you're doing. Yeah, it's it's very good. It's very it's very good. Yeah, I'm impressed. Actually, I've been impressed by a couple of the questions today. You know what? You know, I'm not going to answer anymore because I don't want to ruin I don't want to ruin this good vibe, man. Uh, listen, uh, Dan John here from DanJohnUniversity.com. Uh, I love answering your questions. Uh, remember, if you have questions, podcast at DanJohnUniversity.com. They'll come to me. And then after that, I will uh, answer them and we'll take care of business. And if they're this good, I will actually learn some things and maybe even steal it in my upcoming articles and books and all the rest. Thank you so much, everybody, and we'll talk to you again soon. And until then, keep on lifting and learning, okay? Thank you.